finally, uh, with famine, drought, floods, crop failures, millions or even billions of refugees, an economic collapse on an epic scale, war seems to me to be inevitable. And on a local scale, I worry about anarchy, banditry, invasion, and feeding ourselves. So I think everybody understands what last man standing means. It's plan A, it's business as, as usual. It requires no change in our behaviour until the collapse engulfs us all. We're already seeing it. Strong, strong nations are commandeering the resources of weaker nations. As I've mentioned before, people in power or wealth have the vested interest in con continuing that situation, the status quo, for as long as possible. And this is definitely the current, the trajectory we are currently on. Now I'm going to read you, let you read these um, dirty tricks and I'll ask you if you possibly do any of them sound familiar to you. They are ways of avoiding making the changes that we collectively need to take. For example, taxpayers worldwide subsidise the coal and oil industry at the rate of $210 billion per year, despite the fact that those industries are making record profits. Taxpayers in the United States subsidize car use at the rate of $257 billion a year, which is $2,000 a year for every taxpayer, irrespective of whether they even own a car. So I ask you, do we as citizens of the world and taxpayers of the world want to continue to subsidize crop withering heat waves, melting ice, rising sea levels of violent storms, or do we want to divert these subsidies into developing climate benign, climate benign renewable, renewable sources of energy such as wind, solar, tidal and geothermal power. If we understand, you know, that there's an interesting definition if you look up the Oxford English Dictionary about what the word crisis means. The word crisis is a series of problems that went unattended until they became terminal. I actually think that the, to, that the faster we open our eyes to these problems, and the faster we start doing about them, then the, more, the, le the less painful the problems will be. And they don't need to basically destroy our society. But if we actually leave them unattended, then they will. Power Down is an idea developed by Richard Heinberg, who is one of the gurus of the sustainability uh, revolution. It's also known as Plan B. Ultimately, what it boils down to is the fact that humans learn to cooperate, to conserve, to share, and in a humane way to reduce their population by voluntary means. Whenever possible, we switch to renewable energy sources we protect and conserve soil fertility, we make progressive efforts to reduce pollution, we plant an absolutely stupendous number of trees, and we change the social and economic structures in such a way that it is actually cheaper to buy a fluorescent light bulb, an energy saving light bulb, than it is to buy an ordinary incandescent light bulb. We will have to change the tax structures so that it makes sense to ride your bicycle to work or take the bus or train, and it certainly does not make sense to get into a private motor vehicle one at a time and drive to work along clogged motorways. However, if we just basically leave it to somebody else to save us, you know, call it God magic or some sort of a miracle or some sort of wonderful technology which somebody else is going to invent and take away the responsibility from us to do anything about it, 
I'm afraid that uh, that approach is the same as doing nothing. And so it inevitably lead us back to plan A or the last man standing scenario. Now, common reactions of people to the message that I'm giving you are, you know, a, a detached, condescending amusement, whereby they're basically trying to tell me that I'm a crank. Other people, you know, put their hands over their ears and they say, don't tell me, I can't bear to, I can't bear to think about it. And those are like the second species of ostrich that buried their head in the sand when the lion was approaching. There are people who possibly might accept that it might happen in some third world remote place, but couldn't possibly happen to them personally. And so they, you know, that's, a, that's another form of denial. And the last reaction is that some people just get um, angry and threatening. I suppose it's worth acknowledging that sometimes um, refusing to face an unpleasant out outcome can be pro-adaptive. An example is the fact that we are all personally going to die. You know? And if we spend all our lives worrying about the fact that we are mortal and we're going to die, then we forget to live. And so dwelling on that fact is not a particularly positive way of proceeding forward. However, things like climate change, we hope, we can do something about it. If we change our energy sources from fossil fuels to sustainable sources, we can make a difference. If we change our farming practices so that we look after the soil, we can make a difference. And so when we try then, therefore, to act as denial and try to avoid making those changes for as long as possible, that is definitely a maladaptive phenomenon. I'm very concerned about an international financial collapse. And the reason for that is because with all of the increase in massive storms and insurance payouts, the insurance industry, which is even larger than the motor motoring manufacturing industry, uh, is very, very worried. Hurricane Katrina cost $200 billion. That happens to be the size of the slush fund that the international insurance companies keep available for major events. We only need one or two more Hurricane Katrinas and the international insurance industry might go bust. I would ask you, if you've got any savings, do they happen to be with insurance companies and how safe are your savings in the event of an international financial collapse? Now finally, what we can do is, is, is build lifeboats because if you're a realist, you have to accept you're never going to get um, international agreement on anything and so we're just going to have to accept that it's too late to save more than a few people. However I think it's important to try to preserve those useful features of modern civilization and things that I'd hate to, to lose would be the knowledge of birth control, understanding of atomic theory, uh, mathematics, physics, engineering. I'd hate to see Tiger Woods golf swing lost to history. And perhaps New Zealand, because of our remoteness and our relatively small population, will be a life raft when the world is engulfed by war, drought and famine. I would remind you that there are two sorts of people that respond to disasters. There are the survivalists and the preservationists. The survivalists run off to the hills with guns and they shoot anyone that comes near and they try to live on you know, tins of corned beef and baked beans. And History shows that they, they don't do very well in this sort of crisis. The other sort of people are the preservationists. These people who try to preserve the seeds, try to preserve the knowledge, the knowledge of science, of astronomy, of history, education, reading and so on. They try to help the communities that surround them. After the collapse of the Roman empires, those preservationist communities were the monasteries, but it doesn't have to be religious or unisex. It can be, uh, it can be any community of like-minded people that want to try to preserve um, civilization.